This is the fall line. This is the third episode in the series. Please listen to episodes one and two and then come back to this one. When we last left off, John and Jane had moved their four younger children to Alabama. As far as we know, they never initiated contact with the Glenn County Police Department again or sought out any updates on Monica and Michael, who were filed away as runaways until the early 2000s. What happened then? We aren't completely sure. The case is still open, and the GBI, though they joined the investigation as well, had archived the case file by the time we contacted them. Due to the ongoing investigation, we were denied details as to the current status of the case or some of the specifics we'd hoped to find. This is understandable, but it left us with a few questions that won't be answered until Monica and Michael's case is solved. We were able to get the GBI cover case sheet, which shows a few different dates. Somewhere between 2002 and 2005, Monica and Michael became, quote, endangered, unquote. Was this simply a reclassification based on changing attitudes and procedures? Did other cases receive the same treatment with an entry into NCMEC and an assumption that, by definition, the missing children were endangered? It hadn't been so in the case of the Millbrook twins from season one. But then again, their case had been closed all those years. There was no one to review the information in a more modern light. In the 1990s, though, Monica and Michael were largely forgotten. Not by their siblings, but by a city, a country, dealing with a drug epidemic. How many children went missing then? reported as runaways or not at all. As for Monica and Michael, well, there weren't leads, but there were stories. One theory was that Monica had run off with one of her boyfriends and that Michael had tagged along. Another was that Monica's boyfriend was a big-time drug dealer and that he owed other drug dealers, enough that they were willing to kill Monica and Michael in retribution. This story seems to have its origins with John and or John's associates though there is no precise, identifiable moment when it began. Because of the prevalence of high-level gang members, one might even call them a cartel, moving through Brunswick at the time, we felt it was important to ask Sheila and Phoenician about this possibility. Whether or not the suggested killers were Miami boys, could it have been possible that they would take out such a grievance on two teenagers who had, if anything, peripheral connections? There was apparently a gang called the Miami Boys active in the area at the time. Do any of you guys feel like Monica's boyfriend was like a big time drug dealer in this gang and that's why they're missing today? No, not anybody in this vicinity. No, nobody in this room. No, nobody in this room. I feel like that's a cop out. That's just an escape goat. She had another boyfriend at a different time. Was he also involved with drugs? I'm not sure if he was or not. We went to the same high school. I don't know what he did outside of high school. I don't think so. But like I said, during that time, everybody was trying to be the next Nino Brown. So everybody was selling drugs. That wasn't, what's funny is that wasn't even a surprise, like, oh, I think he was selling drugs. So everybody was then. Nothing big time where she had to fear for her life or anything like that because, I mean, if he was such this high-powered drug lord, why just do the brother and sister when you got the whole family? Phoenician added that Monica's boyfriend, who they remember only as Joey, didn't have a car or fancy clothes. She remembers him living in what she described as the projects basically underscoring that this young man was not a big player in the drug game. Another important thing to remember is that they disappeared from the Heritage Apartment Complex, not somewhere anyone with a grudge would have been looking for them. Who would have known that they were there? They had ostensibly arrived to pack up an apartment, but they'd never spent a single night in John's home. We suppose it's possible that someone could have seen them there. We do have reports of drugs and drug activity in the complex at that time but it seems unlikely that Monica's boyfriend would have remained in town unscathed after his girlfriend and her brother met their demise because of his drug debts. And if so, what a perfect silence kept for 29 years, not a whisper of them. So we think the drug connection is unlikely. As we discussed the last episode, we doubt they ran away, especially considering that they were both staying with relatives at the time and, according to family, would have come to them first. And even then, Why not resurface as adults when all the danger would be past? 
We cannot prove that they did or didn't run away, but the reclassification of their case makes it seem less plausible. If Monica had run off with a young man, well, who was he? Her boyfriend, the one the family knew, was still in Brunswick. As Sheila explained, Does a runaway story match with their personalities? Can you make that make any sense in your mind? Like, yes and no. Runaway, yeah, because they didn't want to be at home. Home is with our mother, with our stepfather, or my my stepfather. But no, because they would have went to somebody, family, relative, somebody. They would have came to one of us at some point. And they had in the past. Monica had come to you guys and wanted your support. So to imagine that she would then leave and go to no one. Right. As opposed to when all your family is here. I was pregnant at the time and she was ready to see her nephew. Like she was looking forward to being an aunt. Yeah, I'm make me cry. And I've lived with this regret for the longest time, right? I was such, I didn't want to be there either. So I, I left and got married young, just wanted to get out of the house. And I felt like for the longest time that I just abandoned her and left her there to fend for herself. I didn't do as much as I should have done to um, get her out of it. Civilian sleuths have wondered about a possible connection between Monica and Michael's disappearance and another case of a missing Brunswick child, a case that ended in the recovery of the body of Christopher Barrios Jr. A warning, the next few minutes of the podcast will include details regarding this child's death, and some listeners may find it disturbing. Christopher was six in 2007 when he was kidnapped, sexually assaulted, and murdered by a family, the Edenfields. George, Peggy, and David Edenfield were all arrested for Christopher's rape and strangulation, with George, David's son, ruled incompetent to stand trial. George and David Edenfield both had prior convictions for sexual crimes, including incest and child molestation. David was sentenced to death for the crime, and his wife, Peggy, participated in it. The details here are so dark that we won't delve into them further. The point of mentioning Christopher's story is to acknowledge the theory, mostly prevalent on web forums, that his death might have a connection to the disappearance of Monica and Michael. We don't see any similarities in this case. The age difference in the victims, the geographic location, the 18 years between the crimes, the lack of any clear connection between the siblings and the Edenfields, it doesn't track. The Edenfields' kidnapping of Christopher seemed to be a crime of opportunity. He was last seen in their trailer park and was staying nearby with a relative. Finally, to be frank, the Edenfields do not seem capable of pulling off a disappearance that could span three decades. Christopher's remains were found within a few days, and the Edenfields were quickly identified as the culprits. So, why do people connect these cases? Perhaps it's as simple as the similarity of the emotional impact. Though she never felt there was a connection in the case, Sheila even once kept a picture of Christopher Barrios in her home. The story spoke to her. There haven't been any other theories of note. No stories of serial killers or sex trafficking or anything else that comes up in a cold case discussion. Anything is possible, especially in a coastal town with a lot of interstate travel and a strong tourist presence, but we haven't found stories to pursue in either arena. This leaves us with the theory that we, and most of the family, believe to be most likely, that Monica and Michael did not survive the evening of June 21st, 1989. We know that in cases of murder, the likely perpetrators can change based on age and demographic. However, we know that we are more likely to be killed by people that we know, and that, for children, those people are more likely to be family members. Most of the studies in this arena are specific to younger children, with a focus on those under five, the most vulnerable to filicide. The FBI reports that of parents who kill their children, fathers are more likely to commit the act and more likely to commit acts of multiple murder within their own families. They're also more likely to premeditate the crime, whereas mothers who kill more often act on impulse, particularly with children under the age of one. That doesn't tell us much about teenagers, though. Even when reviewing the FBI's classifications for the different types of parents who commit homicide, the statistics are skewed toward the very young. How likely is it for a parent to kill a teenager? 
The short answer is, it's not, at least by official tallies. Two-thirds of children who die by homicide are under one. And of the 450 or so children killed by their parents each year, only a handful are between the ages of 14 and 17. It's easier to find stories of children who kill parents than the reverse. As CNN points out, though, teenagers are likely to be the target of abuse. Quote, According to the most recent statistics from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, some 30% of all victims of physical abuse are adolescents. Young adolescents, those between 12 and 15, are especially likely to be targets, with more than 25,000 official cases of physical abuse in this age group reported annually. So, this is a rarity, but in the case of Monica and Michael, everything is unusual. In order to understand what might have happened, we have to examine some of the family relationships and especially how those relationships changed after the teens disappeared. Tired of long waits and rushed care at the ER and urgent care clinic? Next time, stay home and let Dispatch Health bring the power of the hospital to you. I call Dispatch Health. A care team of medical professionals actually come to your house. They're the same caliber of people that you would see if you were at a hospital or an urgent care. Dispatch Health can treat most non-life-threatening emergencies. They can do the x-rays, they can do stitches. Urinary tract infections, blood tests, urinalysis, ultrasound. It's almost everything that they can do at the ER. You never feel rushed. They're there for you and only you. I felt like their only patient. And it costs no more than a trip to urgent care because Dispatch Health is covered by most insurance, including Medicare. See if we serve your home at DispatchHealth.com. Dispatch Health really went above and beyond. It's wonderful to have care come to your home. House calls are back, and they're better than ever. Learn more at DispatchHealth.com. Sleep Meditation for Women is a daily podcast that has a little bit of everything. Morning meditations, sleep meditations, affirmations, sounds, anxiety meditations, gratitude meditations, and more. The meditations are created with anyone who identifies as a woman in mind and are also inclusive of all who feel called to listen. It's perfect for someone who loves a variety of meditations and sounds and is great for a newbie or a seasoned meditator. It's so easy to get started. You can just press play and start listening to a meditation right away. And there is a massive library of meditations and past episodes covering a huge variety of topics anxiety, forgiveness, gratitude, calm, presence, sadness, and so much more. So, go follow Sleep Meditation for Women now wherever you listen to podcasts and start listening for free today. Just search Sleep Meditation for Women on your favorite podcast app and follow. Over a single week in February 1942, a sadistic serial killer stalked London's bomb-ravaged streets, hunting for victims in the bars and clubs of the city's West End Theatre District. In his cruelty and depravity, he was immediately likened to Jack the Ripper. Using new research from police files, court transcripts, and exhaustive genealogical studies, season two of Hallie Rubenhold's Bad Women reconstructs the lives of the women he attacked and murdered, women who were dismissed for working in the sex trade or for choosing to live otherwise independent lives. Bad Women, the Blackout Ripper, examines what placed these women at the margins of society and why the war years were perilous for so many women. Listen to Bad Women wherever you get your podcasts. It's time to talk about Uncle Jake, John's brother, and how he helps connect some of the fragments in this story. Uncle Jake had been an uneven presence in the children's lives, starting from the time Sheila was little and her mother first met Michael's father. Uncle Jake often stayed with them in tight quarters with a growing family because he was between jobs or because he was in trouble. He was convicted of check fraud during Sheila's childhood, but there are other things too. Allegations, not proven cases, of more serious and problematic behavior. Specifically, allegations of sexual abuse of children, both inside and outside of his immediate and extended families. Sheila was one of those children. When Monica was very small and Sheila was just a few years older, she tells us she was molested by Uncle Jake. 
At the time, she thought he went to jail for it, but only recently through the podcast research, she found out that wasn't the case. He was gone for a while after that, but then he lived again with the family, even after he had allegedly assaulted Sheila. The story has been versions of the following. Uncle Jake would get in trouble here or there for messing with kids, and then he'd lose a job or a girlfriend or just need to get out of town, and then he'd end up living with his brother John. The family often wondered why he was so willing to put Jake up, especially with the dramas that could often follow. But it also seemed as if they had a fair number of secrets between them. After Monica and Michael disappeared, the coded conversations, the vague references, the veiled threats, the family remembers it all increasing. And yet, John apparently loaned his brother money, fed him, and let him live with his children, with Jane's children from her previous relationships, including the one he allegedly molested. Sheila's decision to leave John and Jane's home, to marry, to escape, well, it makes a lot of sense. Even as the children grew older, Jake was often there, and Phoenician can still remember both the warnings her mother gave her and the strange conversations her father and uncle had. Remember, by this time they were back in Alabama, and though their mother would leave their father at various points, the two always ended up back together. Often, Jane would leave the girls with John and be the one to vacate the family home. On one of the many occasions Uncle Jake was over, Phoenician recalls a strange conversation taking place. No, we asked about some, oh, uh, some music. Yeah, some music, some cassette tapes. He said it was in that it's in car the in the woods. Somewhere. In the wood. Yeah, in the woods somewhere. Oh, that car's in the woods somewhere. And then there was like silence. Like and his brother gave him a look like, like did you did really you just say that? It? His brother, can y'all talk about his brother? What do you remember about him? I've just always known to not ever be around him alone. Is that how you want to put it? Yeah, to make it short and simple. So we don't really, we've never really been around him. We've heard that he had an alleged history of preying on young women. Mama told us mm -hmm. she won, and you know, he stayed with us a couple mm -hmm. of times. I guess we were kind of lucky nothing happened to us because we I mean, just like, well, she had warned us, so we always stayed away. We always stayed in the room, so don't walk around the house in pajamas. Always, you know, yeah, had your clothes on and stuff like that. So you knew that he was a threat. Yeah, mm -hmm. which don't make no sense yeah, because I wonder, why, well, why is he here? Yeah, <laughs> why are you letting him stay here? We got to be uncomfortable in our own home. Yeah, right. But that's not the sum total of it. Much later in life, when Phoenician was married to her first husband, he reported an odd discussion that he'd had with Uncle Jake. As always, this is presented as a memory, not a fact. Everything must be viewed through that lens. Still, it paints a dark picture of what might have happened in June of 1989. As Phoenician told us recently, He told it to my ex-husband. And he what? told it to uh, the woman he was dating that we cannot figure out her name. Can you say what he told? He had mentioned to my ex-husband that he had killed two of his kids, just like that. They was working together for a moving company. And um, he had slipped and told him that. And he came home and he told me, he was like, you know what your uncle told me? And I'm like, what? Well, he done said now. <laughs> He was like, yo, he said, your dad killed two of his kids. Mm, they was at work. And I was like, what? He said that? He told me, yeah, that's what he told me. What was your feeling? I was like, he really said that. I was in shock. And he had mentioned it to um, the woman he was dating at the time also. And how did she relay that information to you guys? We don't remember. I don't know if she had mentioned it to my parents about what he had said or something like that. She also recalls a time that Uncle Jake telephoned with a threat for their father. And he had called and threatened Data one time and said something about I'm going to bring your playhouse down or something like that. I remember that. You remember that? They got mad at each other. Yeah, they was arguing at the time. And it was kind of weird because all of a sudden they was friends again. <laughs> yeah. He's like, I'm bring your playhouse down. Playhouse is such an interesting term to use here. Perhaps completely unintentionally, Uncle Jake evokes the tin dollhouse that came crashing down to protect Monica, even if it was just for one night. 
There are many ways to read their interactions here. That Jake truly knew something about John, or that he simply suspected that pretending to know would be enough. Or perhaps that he might have even been involved had anything occurred. Think back to the car that went missing after Monica and Michael did, and the bedspread that disappeared before the move. The black trash bags by the door, which John claimed contained Monica and Michael's things. Proof that they had packed to run away, though they had never kept a single thing at his apartment. In either case, John kept his doors open to Jake even when Jane protested, even when his daughters grew frightened. There seems to be a precarious balance that all the adults were loath to upset. Phoenician remembers a time that, when she was an adult, it was suggested she send her daughter home to visit relatives in Alabama. That would mean her father, John, certainly, but also her uncle, Jake. Remembering her own childhood, she was taken aback by the very idea. Over the years, the remaining siblings heard a scattering of strange conversations about Monica and Michael. The dominant narrative was that they'd run away, or, later, that a boyfriend of Monica's had gotten in trouble and that Monica and Michael had been their attribution. We know that. But underneath that story were other conversations, such as the habit John had of bringing them up at odd times, and Jane not at all. Then there were John's purported blackouts and the violent fits all the children remember seeing. Phoenician recalls that John threw a television set at their mother. Tawana, another of the younger siblings, explained a bit more about these odd spells in her interview. I just think there's another side to him that maybe no one's seen. Just kind of sense it. Like there's maybe another side to him that nobody's seen. He does like crowds and stuff. I've always known him to, he don't like being around a lot of people. So that's probably where a lot of that comes from. And it's weird because we've always grown up hearing that about blackouts. He's talked about it? He's always, we've always heard about it. Blackouts, you know? Mm hmm. So he's like, oh, okay, we thought that was like normal for him. Okay, he had blackout. I just think there's been enough quiet talk about it. It just needs to come out in the open if he did anything or even if he didn't. I mean, I just want to know the truth. I think it's time for the truth to be told, whether they get mad or not. Maybe somebody knows something. And Miss Evelyn, Monica and Michael's grandmother, she has her own views of what that something might be. Do you think her fear of him increased since then? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Because she had came here leaving him, came from Alabama, come here. She stayed with me for a little bit, you know, uh, probably a week or so. And then her and Renisha, they got an apartment together and she was staying there. And his way of getting her to come back to Alabama was he had some one of his friends to call and say that he had fallen out, you know, and for her to come right away and see about him. Now, why couldn't the friend take him on to the hospital, you know, and not call her? But that's what he did, call her, and then she goes, and when she get there, oh, he's feeling so much better. So he may be used to manipulating in order to get her to return to him? Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the way I feel about it. Is there anything else that listeners should know about Michael and Monica? No. I do remember when they were having this program on TV about the missing children, and they had them on there. I strictly called her and told her what time they are coming on and for her to look. She didn't do it. Her saying was, oh, I forgot. But I feel like she knew not to do that, you know, because he didn't want to know about it. What are your feelings towards your daughter after all of this has happened? Well... I don't feel no worries, you know, no animosity or anything. I just feel sorry for her. I really do. Because it seems like she just don't have no control over her own life, you know? That's my feeling. She just lets him do whatever he wants to do. And he got, I don't, I, I shouldn't say it because I don't know that for sure, but he has outside children 
you know, since they've been married. Since she married him, he's had other children? I don't know whether it's one or two, but I think the both of them are girls. Mm -hmm. And she had to do with all of that. You mean your daughter became aware of it? Oh, yeah, she knew about it. Mm -hmm. But she still stayed on there, so I felt like that was being controlled, you know. Can you imagine any way that she could get outside of his control? If he's not around, that's the only way. If he's not around, then okay. But as far as him still being around, he going to control her. So as long as he is alive? Yeah. He, he won't be around to control her, you know, and then she'll be okay. But as long as he's... Above ground, no telling what he'll be holding over her, you know. I have no idea whether they discussed the missing of the children or not. I don't know. But it's so strange how they were missing. The policemen, I don't, they never questioned me, you know. So I don't know what they were doing. They never came to ask me, did I, was I a relative or what? Nothing like that. And I don't remember them coming out there searching the area, you know, because some parts of it were woods behind there. And I don't remember them doing that. If he did anything, he he going scot-free. All these years, he's going scot-free, but I've known things like that to backfire. I still say it is strange how things went about, you know? Because why, why couldn't the policemen just keep, uh, well, if they didn't um, insist on them continuing to um, check this thing out, they're not going to do it. In the paperwork that we have received, they were reported as runaways by both parents. Oh, really? That's my first time knowing about that. Well, maybe that's the way they had it set up, as saying they ran away. Because they was in, he was, was the last one to have seen them. So he could say anything and, and tell her and make her believe it, you know. Even though they are in their 30s, I think that they would have contacted somebody in the family. You know, all this time, I don't know whether they really see if they had social security cards, whether they were working or not. I don't know any of that. I think they have done searches on their social security numbers. Well, do you think uh, they would have gotten um, new numbers? I can't answer that question, but I've never heard of that happening before. I don't know, but deep down within, and I hope the Lord will forgive me if I'm wrong, but I really feel like he's responsible for them leaving or whatever happened to him. I think he's responsible because he was the last one to see the children, the last one. So that's the way I feel about it, that he is responsible. And whatever it is, she's going along with it. Next time on The Fall Line, we'll explore what has happened in the years since Monica and Michael's disappearance. This includes Sheila's work with a criminology class, the reclassification of the police file and the GBI involvement, and other important elements in the case. We'll have interviews with the professor from that Georgia Coastal class, former instructor and current author Lawrence Johnson, and also with the student who took part in the investigation. If you know of a case that should be covered on the fall line, there's a link to our case submission form in the show notes. Thank you for listening. The Fall Line is an independently produced show, and we appreciate listener support. It allows us to do research, obtain FOIA, pay our content advisors, and support and donate to the causes we care about. If you try out the products we advertise, please use our sponsor codes. It really helps. And if you'd like to support the show and the stories we cover, Join us over on Patreon. 
All our Patreon earnings fund the Millbrook Twins billboard and go to the therapy fund for families who've been on the show. Each and every one of our patrons helps us to continue this work, and we're so grateful for your help. On Patreon, you can get early release ad-free versions of our regular episodes for $5 a month. We've also added occasional live streams and blogs, which all patrons can enjoy starting at just a dollar. If you prefer Apple Premium, we're beginning that feed as well, so you can have an alternative way to contribute. Again, 100% of these funds go to support the Billboard and Therapy Fund. The Fall Line is written, hosted, and researched by Laura Norton, with additional research by Brian Waters, Kiana Burgess, and Michaela Morrill. Interviews by Brooke Hargrove. Produced, engineered, and scored by Maura Curry. Content advisement by Brandy C. Williams, Liv Fallon, and Vic Kennedy. And always, our most special thanks to Angie Dodd, Liz Lipka, and Sarah Turney. Currently, our monthly donation is going to Private Investigations for the Missing. Please join us in supporting this nonprofit. They need funds to help families access the services of PIs. Mm-hmm.